Welcome to KELA's Let's Talk About It. Discussions on a variety of topics of interest to Southwest Washington area listeners. Write down our listener call in number and keep it handy. 330-5352. That's 330-KELA. You're invited to join in with your calls now at 330-KELA. Views expressed on this show are those of the host, guests, and callers and are not necessarily those of the station, its management, or advertisers. Daily programs are recorded for playback, podcasts, and promotional purposes. And now, let's talk about it. Good morning, and welcome back to the Let's Talk About It show on AM 1470 KELA. Maybe you're streaming at KELAAM.com. I'm your host, Peter Obarno, for another edition of Let's Talk About It. Uh... For those of you who who don't know, I I normally host, I've hosted this show probably for seven or eight years every day, Monday through Friday. And then when I got elected to the legislature, uh, we do now a Let's Talk About It Sunday show that runs before Fox News uh, with Shannon Bream. It runs on uh, KELA AM 1470 in the morning. And then in the evening, it runs on KMNT 104.3. But I often will host uh, during the week when some of our regular uh, disc jockeys like uh, Jamie Lund is out uh, and maybe sometimes when there's a special request that I host during the week for a certain guest. So yeah, on Friday, I hosted as well. And it was a, a really uh, a good show, I think. We talked about all six initiatives, the three that passed the legislature and three that are going to be on your ballot in November for you to decide. And we talked a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, we had a number of callers. I was only able to get to, to one of the callers who, who talked a little bit about not liking the fact that uh, police are militarized and that uh, they're, you know, too powerful, for instance, and that there's too many of them. And, I, you know, my argument was uh, that may be so in some states. Uh, you can make those arguments. In Washington State, we have the lowest number of law enforcement officers per capita. And... I mean, that's pretty recognized across the board, and it's not hard to know why. I mean, the legislature has passed a number of different uh, legislations that reduce sentences for criminals who prevent law enforcement officers from doing their jobs when they want to pursue, for instance, uh, and what that standard of care is, and then holding law enforcement officers uh, personally liable under a reasonable person standard rather than uh, potentially a reasonable law enforcement standard. So we now have the lowest number of law enforcement officers. We also coincidentally have among the highest crime we have ever seen in the state of Washington. And now I've had people say, you know, that's you saying it. I don't believe it. These are FBI statistics. The FBI statistics list Washington state as number one in robberies, right? I mean, that's that's number one in the in the nation. The homicide rate is at a 27-year high. The aggravated assault in Washington State is the highest it's been in 24 years. Robberies have spiked nearly 29%. And those are some of the statistics. Now, we can go through all the property crime statistics like stolen cars and uh, just you know graffiti and just the things that are just nuisances or property crimes, but we're talking about legitimate crimes that are against persons in their homes, on the street, in their neighborhoods. And so we've got a number of different folks running for governor, and one of them is Bob Ferguson, who's the attorney general. And many will blame Bob Ferguson for some of this fault, and you should. Because a lot of the legislation that the House and Senate pass are agency requests from the Attorney General's office and how he pursues legal uh, remedies and litigation against individuals and law enforcement officers. So Bob Ferguson says that he has a powerful record pursuing justice for victims, improving community safety, and holding violent criminals accountable. Most are online, if you follow online, are kind of laughing at that because based on his agency requests and based on his rhetoric, that is just absolutely not true. And if it was true, he should be speaking out against 
House and Senate Democrats when they waived victim impact fees. If you don't know what those are, say, uh, I mean, tragically, somebody gets raped and a criminal gets arrested or charged and arrested. And, and part of that sentencing, they in the past would pay a victim impact fee. And those fees go to, you know, uh, emotional support uh, animals at the courthouse, uh, treatment for, for uh, PTSD, maybe medical treatment. And House and Senate Democrats have continually passed legislation that eliminates those fees that help victims. They, they, they've chose criminals over victims. Now, if you're a Democrat out there and saying, uh, Peter's just being overly partisan, just look it up. I mean, I, I'm trying not to be person, but look, you, you've had Democrats have had governors for 40 years. They've controlled the House of Representatives in the state of Washington for over 20. Now they've controlled the Senate for five or six. And there was a short stint where uh, Republicans had had a majority that they cobbled together. But generally, this is a one party state in which the governor appoints all these agency heads and can really pass whatever they want. Few things that Republicans can do. Now, Republicans offer amendments. They, they, they uh, can, can have a lot of process things. They've had, actually, this session has been fairly successful in the things that we've stopped as Republicans. And of course, capital budget, which requires a supermajority, and hopefully uh, Democrats don't get a supermajority because that's the one budget that allows for investments within our community. But Bob Ferguson has a quote-unquote comprehensive plan that would increase the number of well-trained police officers. Uh, he will use his resources that fuel the epidemic to implement a fentanyl crisis response plan, combat gun violence and mass shootings, pursue arrests at large offenders and actively arrest warrants for violating the terms of parole, and equip law enforcement officers with improved technology and data. These are all things that got weakened by his party in the legislature. And not only were those weakened by his party, which he should speak up about. In addition, your right to defend yourself in your home or in your business or on the street has been grossly limited. So not only are, 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 are criminals emboldened to commit crimes because there's no punishment. But then law-abiding citizens and victims don't get compensated and can't protect themselves. W what are your thoughts on this? Because we are, I mean, maybe crime has not hit you personally or hit you or someone you know personally. But generally, when you look at uh, any poll, whether it's statewide, local, or national, it, whether, whether real or perceived, there's a crime crisis. And statistically, from the FBI and the Washington State Patrol, most certainly their statistics are showing that there's a crime crisis. So what do we do about it? Bob says he's got the plan. Sadly, his party has created this mess, and he's not spoken up about it. And actually had agency request legislation that, that weakened it. And maybe you could argue cause the problems. What do you think? 360-330-5352. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Hey, um, two things. Uh, first off, uh, comment. Last, on Friday, um, you said that in Washington State we have a, uh, or at least in this area, child care uh, desert, basically. You know, and we didn't have that until the state decided to start sticking their nose in in child care, uh, people watching other people's kids and start requiring licenses and <laughs> permits and all this other kind of stuff, training and, and absolutely. Whatnot. You're right. Now, now I'm f all for making sure that the person watching your child is, is has, you know, the basic IQ that they're able to watch after a kid. But it seems whenever the state decides to stick their nose in something, things get messed up. Yeah. No, did, did, you, you're so right. And, and, and it's Stan line because I want to, to talk a little bit more about this. You're absolutely right. I mean, um, the, the number of regulations and zoning regulations and, and, and professional certificates, the cost to 
open, manage, and create a workforce on early learning has become a bureaucracy from Olympia down. And it is it, it has caused the desert. Right, right. And and that's kind of that was the one comment I wanted to make about that. And then also, you know, I haven't heard anything about uh, term limits for governor and making sure that the governor can no longer use emergency uh, uh, make emergency powers. In, in, yes, I think yeah. very much uh, emergency powers. Yeah. And curtailing that because um, while the minority leader signed on to it, uh, you know, it went on way too long and the governor was not forced at all to give those up. So let me start with the first on the emergency powers. Um, Chris Corey, a Republican out of Yakima and myself reintroduced that emergency powers bill last year and it went nowhere. And it's always part of my kind of list of we need to we let's not forget the past. I mean, we're you know, we know how it's impacted kids and students and learning loss. Um, if we don't deal with um, the, the, the past history and say, if we have another pandemic or if we have some other emergency, what is that going to look like from the executive branch? We're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I, I introduced that with Chris Corey again last year. Um, and I would imagine, I mean, if, if he wants to, um, I will be introducing that again this year that limits that power. Well, you know, I, I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but we really need to make a full court press Media isn't easy to grab in this state, but we do have the Internet. We do mm -hmm. have different things. We can have uh, town hall meetings that focus on that in order to get people's attention for those so that they can write into their legislators or um, messages to the governor's office, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Really need to start doing a full court press on it. No, I, I agree. Um, and, and that's a nonpartisan issue. I mean, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, there needs to be a, a some sort of checks and better checks and balances on major executive orders um, from the legislature, which is closest to the people. And then on your other issue of term limits, I, I support term limits. I've, I've been open. Uh, I don't know what that looks like, uh, whether it, whether it's a five year, 10 year, whether it's a five term. I don't know how that looks, but I've always supported uh, the fact that. You know, we should be a legislature, especially one like in Washington, should be a next up type legislature where, um, you know, you go in, you do your job, you represent your community, but then it's next up. I mean, people shouldn't be there for a generation. Right. Well, I agree with that. And and I think that that uh, term limits in the legislature and the Senate, you know, they need to uh, those need to be addressed also, but definitely the governor's office. Yeah. No, I agree. If the governor does a great job after two terms. Well, then the person that follows him or her continue on. Yeah. Uh, if not, that gives an out, just like the United States was given when FDR passed away. We kind of, you know, dodged a bullet there, and and uh, after that, term limits were uh, was voted on and passed. Uh, at the federal level. And I, I think it's something that we need to really think about. So anyway, those are my comments and thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. No, those are good comments. No, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and he's right on. I mean, on the desert side, most certainly the best way to, to loosen uh, or how about we water the garden on early learning rather than talk about a desert uh, is, is workforce development, uh, zoning, and, and regulations uh, and what that looks like. And then the next would obviously be investments in early learning facility grants so that you could actually create space or allow for private public partnerships or private uh, child care and early learning facilities to be able to expand, uh, especially locally. You know, this was a huge problem for my wife and I. We struggled with this, you know, 12, 13 years ago and nothing is better. I mean, the state of Washington is still facing the same type of early learning crisis and, and, and people are struggling and, and parents don't get the opportunity to seek, you know, educational or economic opportunity. So it's twofold. One, a quality early learning has really lifelong benefits to children and students because we want them to be kindergarten ready. And two, it's also an economic side. On the crime side of it, you know, um, somebody, uh, you know, messaged me and was saying, hey, you know, well, wh what did the Democrats do? I mean, you, you, you can't throw out that, 
they've weakened it and nothing has changed. And we, and we know that it was a struggle and took a special session for Blake, which was to criminalize illicit drug possession and to create some sort of off ramps for treatment. Um, they decriminalized it and we know they did. And, and so it, luckily there were enough votes cobbled together in the House between all the Republicans and a few Democrats to force a special session to actually recriminalize it and create off ramps because I think that's the right thing to do. But, and if you have a pen, you can write these down. I mean, feel free. A uh, House Bill 1268 reduces the sentences for gang, drug, and gun-related crimes around schools, bus stops, and those protected zones. Now, that passed uh, with 53 of the 58 Democrats voting yes. So you tell me, 53 Democrats, no Republicans voted to reduce sentences for gun-related crimes around schools. And so you'll see the news and you'll see whether it's Seattle Times or, or, or the News Tribune talk about guns, guns, guns. But I bet they have not covered House Bill 1268 and why someone would reduce the crime, the sentences for those folks who commit crimes around the most vulnerable people. Then there's House Bill 2030 that would allow convicted murderers we, we've, and if you're on social media, you've seen these memes. Murders like Gary Ridgway, who's spending life in prison. He would be allowed to vote, serve on a jury, and hold public office. And eight Democrats sponsored that bill, including those from Thurston County, which I know this airwaves get out there. House Bill 2177 would require, not allow, not be not be permissive it would require sex offenders to serve on the state sex offender policy board to set their own rules of release and then this one too house bill 1396 would reduce the sentences for aggravated first degree murder i mean th these are these are policies that either passed were introduced uh we're, we're in committee. I mean, these are policies that are likely going to come back. And this is, and Bob Ferguson wants to help with, you know, reducing crime that, that, that was created by his own party. So what are we going to do? I mean, let's be pragmatic about it. There are now, like I said, there's, there's probably a handful of, of Democrats in, in, the, in the House and Senate who did not vote for these policies, would not sign on for these policies because they're representing their communities. But generally, when you have a party in power for as long as the Democrats have been in power, boy, they can twist some arms on their members to take bad votes. And we saw that take crime out of it. We saw that during the phase out of natural gas. And we saw some folks up in the Puget Sound uh, voting when it was at, at two in the morning voting when it was 30 degrees out to phase out and ultimately ban natural gas in the homes of the constituents they represent. And word is, and this has been in the newspaper, the governor was calling those members and, and making those threats, saying, hey, you need to vote to ban natural gas or else. Good luck with your bill coming for my signing it was it was it was it was definitely a a rough night on the house floor and it ultimately is is you know this is kind of what we're talking about now bob ferguson thinks he can fix it i'm not so sure and and i'm i'm not i'm not for for those of you who love bob ferguson out there i'm not picking on him he released this plan within the last couple of days so that's why i'm talking about this plan if somebody else releases their plan i'd probably talk about that too 360-330-5352. You're listening to Let's Talk About It. I'm your host, Peter Ovarno. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Peter. It's so good to hear your voice on there this morning. Yeah, it's good to, good to hear you call in. Thanks for calling in. <laughs> You're welcome. See, um, reading the paper about this, what they're wanting to, uh, he passed and signed to teach our young kids in school, that's my tax money. I think people need to raise up. I don't know how you would do it, but they need to say, hey, you want my tax dollars for schools? Then 
stop this, uh, all that garbage of teaching the kids the other side that don't need to know about it. Yeah. And I don't want my tax dollars going to that. Now, how do I stop it? Well, there's, you know, first of all, you need to make sure you're very vocal with your school board. School boards sometimes will wash their hands of it and say, well, there's nothing I can do. That's not necessarily true. I mean, you should be reaching out to your school board members. You need to also continue to comment and reach out to the uh, uh, the Office of uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Reichdahl, uh, because most of these are agency requested by him. Um, and, and then the other keep reaching out to us for sure. Um there were a number of pieces of legislation, uh, at least I know the members of the 19th and 20th voted against, uh, not only that forced material in the classrooms, but that did not allow schools to stop materials from coming into the classroom uh, or they would lose all their funding. And that, that was a huge, and you can go on, I mean, I always encourage you to go to some of my legislative pages and, and whatnot to look at um, the speeches and uh, some of the material that was produced. Um, boy, uh, that's the best ways to stay vocal and stay engaged. I mean, there are a lot of good teachers out there who don't want this either. I mean, I know a lot of teachers who sit on, you know, DEI training calls. They're supposed to be learning how, you know, teaching methods and different ways to teach. And unfortunately, they're, they're stuck 90% of their time on DEI calls. And they're frustrated too. So, you know, you'll hear some of the WEA issues um, coming out of the Seattle teachers, but when I talk to local teachers, Centralia, Chehalis, uh, Lewis County, Cowlitz County, uh, most of them are frustrated with this too. Well, why why can't it be put before the people to vote on this stuff? Well, we do have a Parents' Bill of Rights, um, and that Parents' Bill of Rights allows parents to have greater access, although the uh, opponents said it didn't give any new access, but it does. It, it it enshrines access for parents to get the materials that are in the classroom. This should shine some light and open a window into what's going on in the classrooms. And and I think what they'll you'll see is you know there's going to be a, in my mind, and this is just my opinion, in the majority of schools, in the majority of classrooms, in the majority of teachers uh, are teaching the right things. Uh, that are value-based for their communities and their students. You will find uh, that it's not in every classroom. And parents also, you know, take hold. <clears throat> the, 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 well, yeah, but how about, you know, it's like me. I don't have any kids in school, so they probably wouldn't even listen to me. Well, I, well, OSPI will. Is out of school, but, you know, I don't like my tax dollars going to teach them how to be gay. Well, I mean— I, I, yeah, I mean, look, if you have concerns about what's going on in school, be active and, and reach out. Um, again, I, I don't, I, in my experience with the teachers I've talked to, that's not happening locally with my teachers, but you may have a different experience. But most certainly, I think the Parents' Bill of Rights is a way to get access, uh, enshrine that access uh, for parents and community members. And again, we want our taxpayer dollars to go uh, and be used in the best way possible. And while you may not have kids, what I love about you is that you're thinking about the fact that this is our next generation who's who's going to be the next leaders and the people who are going to be supporting us. And so I, I like the fact that even if you don't have kids in the school now, you're thinking about it. And I appreciate that. Hey, I got to move on. I got to take a call or to, I got to I'll take more calls, but I'm going to uh, take a quick break for our sponsors and I want to thank you all for tuning in to Let's Talk About It Show. We'll be right back in just about a minute. Hi, this is Jeff and Julie from Fairway Lanes. Jeff and I met Jacek of Summit Funding at our bowling center. So when we fell in love with this community and it was time to relocate, we knew we would be calling Summit Funding. They understand that everyone has a unique situation when buying a home. He had already helped two of our employees get into their own homes. The Summit Funding team exceeded our expectations. It was a seamless experience with great communication from his whole team. Thank you to Summit Funding for making our buying experience special and memorable. 
Home is where your story begins, and Real Estate Marketing Group offers more. More service, more opportunity. As a proven leader in the industry, they're the company to represent your investment property. If you're looking to rent, buy, sell, or manage your property, Real Estate Marketing Group has you covered. They're located on Jackson Highway and at re-mgi.com. Real Estate Marketing Group is here for all your real estate needs. Real Estate Marketing Group, they do more. Oh, it's cold. It may be freezing cold outside, but it doesn't have to be freezing cold inside. Not when you have a train heat pump from your independent train dealer, Shahela Sheet Metal Heating, Cooling, and Roofing. They're your one stop for total comfort, and they'll make sure you're ready for whatever the winter has to offer. You can rest easy and in comfort knowing your home's in good hands with Shahela Sheet Metal and Train. There are some great rebates you can take advantage of as well. Find out more at ShahelaSheetMetal.com for services and special offers. It's hard to stop a train. Starlight Sports Bar and Lounge at Little Creek Casino Resort is your place to get in on the action. We have a 20-foot LED wall, 12 85-inch screens, and a live sports sticker to make sure you have all your sports spectating needs in one place. The new menu bolsters all fresh, never-frozen ingredients and 20 beers on tap. Each week, we'll feature live music and a dance floor to get the party started. Visit LittleCreek.com to view the weekly entertainment lineup at Starlight Sports Bar and Lounge, your place to get in on the action. We we back, we back in the speakers. On the web, on your phone, and on the air. K E L A. <laughs> Let's talk about it. All right, we're back on the Let's Talk About It show. AM 1470 K E L A. KLAAM.com. I'm your host, Peter Robarna, with another edition of Let's Talk About It Show. Just a reminder, and I talked about it, uh, a little self-serving uh, event coming up. April 9th at the Veterans Memorial Museum, Representative Ed Orcutt and I are going to have a little kickoff breakfast, so feel free to come by. It starts at 7.30, where we'll get you out at 8.30-ish, uh, but should have some good speakers, some good fun. I got my good friend Bailey Moon, former... Uh, you know, or as Bailey Peters, maybe former Miss Lewis County, going to be emceeing again, and and uh, Jeannie Collins from Bethel Church is going to do the invocation. So we got a good event coming April 9th at the Veterans Museum. Um, just good good times. Uh, have some eggs and bacon or something, and enjoy some uh, discussion. All right, we're back three six zero three three zero five three five two. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Yeah, you said they were limiting our ability to protect ourselves in our home. How are they doing that? Well, you know, there with laws and guard in terms of how you can protect yourself, in terms of how you can carry, whether you can carry, whether you can do it on your own property anymore. Uh, as you recall, last year in the legislature, uh, there was a uh, permitting uh, per- permitting event bill that, if, for instance, say uh, you had a parade coming down your street and it was a permitted event, and you were having your weapon uh, either at your house or say you stepped over your property to your neighbor's house. Uh, you wouldn't be able to actually carry. Uh, it was really odd that they had a bunch of different pieces of legislation that started to encroach on personal property uh, by using uh, permitted events as a way to get in. Uh, I so guess I don't understand how carrying a weapon, especially like an AR-15, outside my property helps defend my property. Oh, you you carry an AR-15 on your property? I didn't. I mean, okay. I mean, most people will do like a handgun or they have a concealed permit that they go through like the law enforcement to make sure they do a background check. Because if you're carrying a handgun, uh, you can't be a felon. You can't be a criminal who's committed an a- like an aggravated assault or murder. You have to be a law abiding citizen to do that. But um, yeah, I don't know about the AR-15 on your property, but most people I think carry handguns. Uh, and go through that permitting process. You have a waiting period, as you know, uh, where they do background checks on you. So those people holding those guns and carrying those guns um, go through the background checks. It's it's really the criminals who don't go through background checks. Uh, those are the ones that we need to worry about. Those are the ones we need to really be focusing on. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Let's Talk About It on AM 1470 KELA. I'm your host, Peter Barno. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I will let you know next time I'm on the air. Maybe I'll do a little announcement. So follow me on Facebook and social media so you can uh, follow along. And uh, look forward to seeing you on April 9th over at uh, the Veterans Museum at 730. Have a good day. Up next, Fox News.
Stay informed.